we are going here. Which basically means you need to ask a lot of questions. How do you answer those questions? Simple Google searches may not help somewhere. After, after a point of time, Google is useless. That's because of the knowledge of the general public, right? Which is the top 10 users, which is you and me, you know, waking up one morning and typing something out. May not be well thought out. So we use a specific term called prior art. It's, it's commonly used by all IP guys or lawyers. Prior art basically means existing before. It's prior art. Art. Whatever you are doing is called art. It's not science. Art. Existing before the date of invention. What is your date of invention? You have not invented anything yet. <laughs> so anything, I mean before one second ago, I mean, just if you start searching now and somebody posts, it's also prior art. Because at least you can establish the confidence that this is the date I admitted it on. Everything before that is prior. So when you go for a patent, they continuously ask you, what is the date of invention? Right. Date of invention in most countries, including India, is the date you put the patent in. Unfortunately, you might have developed it five years ago, but the day you put it in the patent office is the date of invention. So from that date onwards, only they will start questioning. Suppose you put the patent in today, that is 21st September 2012. File it today. And some fellow goes and publishes entire paper on your technology tomorrow. That will not be considered. When finally they scrutinize your technology, they will take this date, not tomorrow, not day after tomorrow. So tomorrow doesn't matter. What matters is yesterday, in this case. What happened before you put it? So whatever you put into the patent office better be newer than what exists already. You need to get something new out there, otherwise you will not get a patent or rights of protection. Even the technology has to be new at some level, you know? cheaper, faster, whatever it is. So when we talk about prior art, this is one way that you can ensure your research is going to have, sorry, not your research, the product is having to have something new about it, something unique about it. And it's not very difficult. But we don't do it because we don't know how to do it. Uh, let me let me tell you this in quick, you know, another 10 20 minutes. How you can go about actually doing this. It's very easy. So yeah. All this, I mean, uh, I have even seen instances where uh, not only a cartoon was used as prior art reference. It's hilarious. But there's this fellow who I don't have the heart to click here like that. There is this fellow who developed a technology for bringing up ships that are sunk in the sea. Ships or anything for them. Treasure chest or something. Even your uh, submarines or anything which is gone under. Right? It's filled with water and all that. So you need to get them back up. So what this fellow has done is you know this uh, table tennis balls, right? TT balls, they, are, they float up. So he has developed similar stuff, TT balls like thing. And he's got a pump, he's developed a pump in which he can pump this under high pressure into the vessel. So what happens if there is a breach like this and the vessel is sunk, he'll pump all the balls inside. So over some time this will become buoyant. This will float up. Now, unfortunately for him, there was a Donald cartoon in which they do the same thing. A Donald cartoon. Means they are doing the same thing. It's, it's all cartoony, right? I mean, they have a lot of these golf balls, football, everything they are pumping in. And they are also pumping in this is called ping pong balls, right? Table tennis balls. They are just pumping it in, into the sea, into something which is sinking. And they make it float. Exact same idea. This fellow did not get a beat. Yeah, it's, it's laughable because the cartoon, you know, kind of screwed up his chances. But you don't have to go to that next step. You can't study everything possible. It's one of those few things which happen. I have also written PhD theses. PhD theses are something which are publicly available actually. If you walk into your college, somebody is a PhD, you can actually take it from the library and read it. So that can become prior at some point of time. It's a good resource to actually do your research on also. This is very important. So by prior research, you need to stop reinventing the wheel at some point. You can't just copy and paste others 
stuff and say, oh, this is invented by me, and I'm going to sell it to you. Because the person who's invented it is going to improve it and take care of the market at some point. You may, it's like, you know, selling options. You will sell it till there are eggs with you. Once the eggs are over, you'll have to find another business. Right? Whereas the fellow who's rearing hens can, can sell off it all his life. Right? So there's a difference, difference in this perspective when you look at how you do this. How do you do search? Where do you do search? Very simple. I mean, go to google.com slash patents. It's a website by Google. They have the entire US patent office's documents that are searchable, easily searchable, easily readable. Uh, something called as Google Scholar, google.com slash scholar. Okay. They have uh, abstracts of all these IEP publications and everything, which is searchable and indexed by them. So if you want to do search on some very poor technologies, you can do search. Something called as free patent online. I mean, they have a repository of all the US, European, Japanese patents. Free. All these resources are free. You don't have to pay a penny for them. You can go in just do simple searches. I mean, just the way you search in Google, right? You just go in and do the search and you get information. And you get specific information, technology related information, information related to what you're developing. I'll give you one example. When I was developing this. When I was developing these ceramic membranes for hot gas purification, we were doing uh, purification of gases at 800 degrees centigrade. So there was one stream of gas which had hydrogen and nitrogen mixed together. We had to separate it out into hydrogen and nitrogen. Sorry, carbon monoxide and nitrogen. So I learned the chemistry of it. But doing something at 800 degrees centigrade is tough. You can't put a polymer, it will just melt. So we had to use something called a ceramic membrane. Right. Once we started digging into it, and I was working with some fellows from uh, MIT who had their, done their PhDs in this particular field of ceramic membrane technology. We started digging, the amount of information available in that technology field is so less. You know, we, the entire thing can be contained in probably uh, half a CD or something. But, I mean, there's not too much information because it's such a specialized field, such a narrow field, such a small field. But the applications are very widespread. Every petroleum refinery would like to have one. So when we started digging, we found that you know the information is limited on the internet. On the internet. So we had to call up colleges one by one. I actually got on the phone to some of the top universities and started inquiring about their PhD thesis. Some of them were unwilling to give that information. And we had to kind of threaten them and say, you know, especially US universities have an obligation to, you know, have these research out there in the open so that people can use it. So we had to get on the call and say, you know, hey, you can't do this. It's, as per law, you have to kind of give up that information. And we found a few theses in MIT and uh, some, some Georgia Tech and all that. We should try to read them and understand. But the most important information that we got was from patents. These PhD students, what they do is, if their technology is yeah, Not absolutely, but if you yes. request for it, it will be Yes, if you request for it, and if it's not under common secrecy, right, at least in US, that's my understanding. Right? When we did it, we did it. And how was this success rate? Almost everybody gets on. But unfortunately, not too, bit, too many people had such research going on. There were very few universities which were undertaking such research. And you were able to get such information just by. Home. Yeah, we were able to get it. We are inquired basically, we were pretty polite in inquiring, you know, do you have some such research going on in the university or not? Uh, many of them said no. Right. And you could go through their website and understand if somebody is specializing in that. Most of the colleges have their website where they say PhD thesis what is going on. So we tried to contact them and many of them were willing to share their partner with that information. Do they have any to in that case? No. They were not. Uh, they kind of tried to create those blogs. So what kind of stone model? They said we can't find it, we don't have a digital archive of it, you will have to come down to the university, read in the public uh, library. So I had a couple of friends go to the university and read it for me. With that also. Yeah, yeah. So I can take a look at it. Yeah, this is a specific problem to face it. If I know which university can take what I want, unfortunately there's a whole lot of so more than that. Yeah. If I just find out that they are already reviewed, I mean, do I have to do this one? Do I have to do this one? 
you know, they are not obligated to give it to you. Right? There is no such what would be the responsibility over there. It's simple enough, approach the library, right, and say you would go, like to go through this section particular, this thesis particular, they will help you out. Libraries don't start more you in the US university sector. And universities are pretty big. What should the response I got back is that they have to talk to the researcher before the release. If it's ongoing research. Apparently it's already published. It's already published, then you should be able to get it. Should be. Yeah, it yeah, should be able to get it. If it's already published, it's public domain. So what this is that is actually stopped. What are the things which can actually stop them from being able to get it? I think it's mean, uh, by law, what is that? Yeah, see, some of the research being done, you know, goes into military technology or communication technology, which is very, very high tech. Or so that's the only thing. Other than that, yeah. there's no general. Nothing general. Nothing general. Nothing general. Any other countries that you're aware of which follow such a, if not a law, but at least an answer to? Answer to in India also you can approach, but unfortunately, see, in India you can approach the IITs and try to get the research. They are, many of them are willingly partners. So by and large, university is pretty open with it. Pretty open with it. I mean, see, the problem comes with the bureaucracy in universities because the librarian probably doesn't know what you are asking for. They will approach the professor. Professor gets all curious, you know, this way you are asking for something. That's exactly is there money to be made here, you know? So it kind of rolls into that human psychology thing, but it's it's less related to law, more related to the people there, you know, how you deal with them. So having said that, I mean, the thesis on one side, Let's say, and again, this is a, a scenario I'm trying to develop and I'm trying to do a lecture of research with a few members. And they all seem to be extremely, uh, though the end product is basically something that they actually helps their students, but they all seem to be very humble about the fact that they want to own 50% of the IP. <coughs> when the thesis is out there, what help does it help? How does it help? It was developed by the university. It belongs to the so is it just bragging rights? Yeah. Or is, is it something they can it's, for? Uh, I'll give you an uh, example. I mean, probably this is unrelated, but then you can take away something from this. Uh, the largest licensor of patents on this planet is uh, MIT, Massachusetts. They license over 700 patents per year. So that, that can probably give you a certain idea of what we are looking so any time you approach a university, they want to be like MIT and they think that you know, at least uh, this will generate some revenue if, if at all there is so. So that's the idea. I mean, I, I don't think they do it deliberately. Uh, that, you know, thinking that this is the most advanced thing, but they are, they are fishing. fishing. They are fishing. They are just fishing. Because obviously most of it has spoken to people who have two more than one. Yeah. Correct. Is that a kind of solution? That's correct. That's true. See. Some of the basic research that happens is very basic. It's good at lab level, but I mean, it's good at the test tube level. Once you scale up from the test tube to a bigger, weaker also it takes. Coming from a chemistry background, I have seen that. Works on the test tube, works under pressure. Bring it to a 50 ml beaker and it doesn't work. Happens. So, basic research and application of basic research are two different topics all over. So that, that knowledge getting transferred and somebody actually scaling it up takes a takes quite some effort. The university doesn't want to just you know give it away because they think they develop the science they should have right to it. But yeah, it's a it's an ongoing issue with most universities today. So would they come up here would they try and enforce it or they can't they until and unless they are protected by patents or something, they can't. They really can't come up here and say you know and basically science cannot be protected by patents. It's available in nature. Most of the scientific laws and principles are available in nature. So if I were to say I want to protect the law of gravity by a patent, this is first. What happens? So anything you discover newly, which is a scientific effect or phenomena, is available in nature. You can't protect it. It's out there in the public and it can be Does any of this deal with patents from India? Huh? Is any of this deal with patents from India? Now, there's a problem there. You have to go to the Indian patent office and do a search. Not go physically as an digital. There's a digital. Yeah, there's a digital archive. But it's not very good. It's not very good. It's not very good. Has it have 
past history or is not very updated? It's not very updated and it's not very easily searched. That's what I should do. And actually, if, even if you go to see, we, we are professionals uh, and we do these searches for clients on a daily basis. We use some databases which cost 10 lakh rupees per year, just one license. Uh, and there are databases which will cost you up to 5,000, 6,000 dollars if you sit on it for one, one hour. I'm talking about some very specific chemistry databases and all. So these non yeah, are because they have are they available for free or like for making it in a database also? They license it out for so much. So I, I can do a search across 97 countries today. Okay, 97 countries. But this whatever I'm telling you free payment online will allow you five jurisdictions. Europe, Europe, US, Japan. Japan also just the whatever is available. Right, and I think Korea partly, China partly. It doesn't give you everything. But this is reasonably good for you to start off with at least your research. I mean, you don't have to do just search, search, search all the time. You're developing something. You want to ask a specific question. You ask specific questions, you get those answers and move on. And do, it's called reasonable due diligence. You do reasonable due diligence to get ahead or move forward. You don't keep beating around the bush and thinking, oh man, I can't get this particular reference. It's going to cost me $100. Forget it. Don't, don't get, it stuck, get stuck there. Move on. Move to the next phase. Most of you are not doing research which will require you to access some of those very obscure scientific journals and databases. If you are, it's better than the university environment because they have the resources. Most universities have a free access to many of very cost, many very, very costly and very um, highly reviewed journals. Deep Nature Science, you know, IEEE, um, Journal of you know, Physics Letters and all those things. These, these are all scientific papers, literature, which can be utilized if you, if you are doing research at that. Most of you might not be doing research at that. Right? Then you don't need that type of resource. These basic resources will kind of help you get ahead uh, solve majority of your you know, planning issues and uh, move forward. Just to add to this list, that we're going to the there's something called the ACA, yeah. the Association of the Year. So 5,000 rupees a year. You get a membership which allows you to access to the internet. Come forward. In the context of the largest search, a lot more cheaper. Yes. Um, something like that. Google Scholar actually covers that. And if you get the abstract from there, you can jump into it. So I did not mention, mention ACM and ever so many. We have a list over 200 journals with this. Are there anything expensive to just send people those numbers? They're pretty expensive. Because yeah. I think to put this slide out, you can access to almost everything. Mostly, you can send it here. I'm assuming I'm mostly going to get a lot of people. It's very relevant. I'm never going to share it because. Most of the conventions they have across the globe, uh, okay. you get a lot of discounts. For example, if you want to attend the single, you get 20% off. Okay. Which is a significant saving. Good. Those are nice as you You can do something else. I mean, there is something called as uh, SCI, -S 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 -I, I have not written it. That search is SCI, -S -I R U S. Right. It's a database built on top of uh, journal databases. So you have your IEEE, you have your ACM, you have ever so many journals. Cyrus is built on top of it. So it searches all through these. It's like a meta. Right? Yeah, it's like a meta. A meta search engine. But is, is, is that free? It's free to search. But when you click on the article, if it's a paid article, then you have to pay and pay. Yeah. So you get the abstract at least. So if you want to jump off and do start doing searches, that's a very good place. It even searches in bigger databases. Would it uh, plug into the different universities? I don't know how far they ahead they have gone now. But last I checked, they were searching through the abstracts of most of the journals. Will you be sharing this presentation with you? Yeah, I have a write-up to share with you because you know, this is very bare bones. I shared a write-up with you guys. So if you do have uh, uh, this, uh, has yeah, definitely it is there for that center of the Yeah, yeah. That's the idea. You know, once I send the right up, I'll send the list also of uh, resources where you can do this. Something similar to Cyrus. Right. 
there's something called as engineering period and they can rattle off names, but then you know they should be careful. Because so depending on who he's worked, they can just be right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean there's an entire list of 200 odd search engines where you can do these very specific searches. So you, so you want to do searches only on optical physics, there's a journal of optical physics where you can go and do the searches also. Anyway. But getting back to asking the right questions. Right? When you go to some of these search engines, get down. They're as good as your searches. They're not going to help you with searches. Right? They will search for whatever you ask. So if you ask for how to solve the mysteries of life, they'll throw you a random BS at you and you're going to struggle with it. So your problems have to be specific right? before you start doing these searches. How do you get to a specific problem is, is something which, which people struggle with quite often, especially when you're developing products. Right? Uh, so for, for that I have four questions. I have not written them now. If you want to take a note, you can. It's very simple. It's very simple to think about that. What's the problem you're solving? How is somebody else solved it? The first question and the second question actually feed back into each other. Third, what's your proposed solution? And how is it better? Simple enough, right? Let's take an example. This is a bit, the bottom one. Let's assume I have a problem here with when I write into the bottom one pen, after some time I see some mark the tip of it and it kind of blots on the paper. Right? You get a blob of ballpoint ink on the paper after some time and it gets punched. It's an annoying problem. I want to solve it. Right? So the problem I'm trying to solve is leakage of ink from ballpoint pen after frequent writing. So if I were to investigate it, what happens actually is the tip of the ballpoint, right? the ball itself is made of a certain material. And the surrounding shell is made of another material. So if you get into some type of materials, and most of you have, most of your science students, right? You have uh, at least any basic material science, I think. Assume 8 to 10 standard, you would have studied it. So two different materials have different rates of expansion when heating. That's what is happening. And two very different materials. When I start writing the restriction, there is heat. One expands. Which one? The shell, which is holding this ball, expands faster than the ball itself, so there is a leakage of it. There's another issue here. There's a third material which comes in. What is that? The ink itself. I'm probably heating up the ink also. And its viscosity is changing. If you have studied fluid mechanics, you understand. Viscosity is very important for the flow of the fluid. If its viscosity is changing at certain heat, certain temperature, it will flow more freely. That is going to be I can solve this problem at multiple levels. Once I understand this phenomena, I can solve the problem at multiple levels. The problem remains here. My proposed solution, here are three different solutions. One, a ballpoint pen where the tip material and the shell material are made of, this, of similar stuff. Right? Two, ink which does not use viscosity properties up to 60 degrees centigrade. Right. Third one, I redesign the ball itself, the ball point. Right. I put pores on the ball, like a golf ball, dimple golf ball, right? So that the leakage of the ink is uniformly spread. It gets captured, and as I write, it gets taken away. Three distinct solutions for the same problem. I'm not saying one is better than the other, I'm not testing it out. I'm just saying there are different solutions. Now I can always investigate further how to get them manufactured. Right. The problem still remains. Now I propose a solution, I'm saying that I'm going to deal with the ink for example. Right. I have to go back, understand the chemistry of the ink, what type of inks yeah, yeah. could. Yeah. 
to what I'll have probably go and investigate what type of ink we are taking and what type of uh, chemistry is there. And if at all I can make it, you know, that viscosity free thing at so and so temperature, what will be the cost? If the cost is going to be very huge, then it does not make sense to put it in your non stew to be then. Probably makes it <coughs> makes more sense to put it in cheaper or possibly part of things. Then you have to think about brand and other things. So it goes into a totally different area. Business wise when you start to think, you have to seriously give your solution up. Probably another thought and say, can you make it work at all? That's how, I mean, asking questions to solve the research problem. You may start with one quick, quick question. You propose a solution by investigating it. Then, for the solution, you'll get another problem. Right? So, what is the viscosity of ballpoint pen? No idea, I don't know. I'll probably do a search for it. Right? As I get deeper and deeper into the tech stuff, what is going to happen is Google is of going to be of no use to me. Because it's not going to give me that specific tech related answer. Then that's when I have to go to Bacon's problem. And see if others have solved a similar thing. If they have, somebody would have solved viscosity of ink or something like that. I'll read through it, I'll understand what is going on there. And then I'll take it further one step and see how we can differentiate it. If at all I can differentiate the problem. Right? That's how I will deal with stuff when it comes to this. It's kind of a linear, I mean, it's a kind of a thought process. One question leads to another question, it leads to another question, and then you go to the entire business scenario and say, okay, this is not easy to throw it out. Let's move forward. There's a method to do it. Probably if I come here another time, I'll, I'll share that methodology with you guys that will allow you to, you know, kind of jumpstart this thinking process and not go through so many iterations. You know, you don't have to spend one year doing only literature research and finally say, I don't have any product. Right. I'll share that some other time. Quickly jumping into trademarks. So far what we have covered is use the internet wisely to answer your problems while you're developing your product or service. You can easily differentiate yourself from your competitors, from, from what is out there, from the products. You can get some kind of advantage. And it's not very complicated. It's not, it's not rocket science. You don't have to go sit in a you know, college to actually do this. You can do this with available sources, resources on the internet today. And this was not feasible 10 years ago. Today it is. <coughs> Trademark. I get asked this question so many times. So many times. I mean, if somebody paid me one rupee every time they ask this question, I would be ultra rich. People come to me and say that I have developed a great new hardware and I have named it R2D2. Yeah, R2D2. Right. I want to go and trademark that. I said, what? The difference between name and brand is very important to understand. You may have a code name for whatever you are developing, the technology, the chipset, the, the algorithm, but you are not going to sell it that way. It's your internal name. It's your internal naming convention that you call a motherboard, you know, R2G2 or something. And, and, and that naming convention is not how you are probably going to package it and sell it. You'll probably put that motherboard or chipset inside, let's say, a digital converter, analog to digital TV, a cable converter, TV to my father. And, and you're going to sell it as, you know, Maha TV or something. The brand is Maha TV and your tech is called R2D. Which one are you going to protect? Probably yes. Probably yes. Why? Or why not? That's what the customer sees. Are you selling it to the customer? Yeah, of course. TV I am selling to the customer. You are selling it to the customer? No, I am selling it to the client. 